Hello and thanks for joining us for this episode of Into the Killing. Do you know any cold cases that were solved that we should cover on Into the Killing? We'd love it if you suggested it on our website, criminallisted.com. You can also suggest cases for our two YouTube channels, Criminally Listed and Paranormally Listed. For this episode, we're going back to October 1981. On October 3rd, 1981, members of the Irish Republican Army, also known as the IRA, ended their hunger strike in May's Prison, which is just outside of Belfast, Ireland. The roots of the hunger strike go back five years earlier to 1976. IRA prisoners had been a special category of prisoners, and they were allowed to wear their own clothes. This was symbolic to them because they believed they were political prisoners and not criminals. In 1976, they lost the privilege to wear their own clothes. Five years later, in March 1981, they went on a hunger strike. The strikers had five demands. Number one, the right not to wear a prison uniform. Number two, the right not to do prison work. Number three, the right of free association with other prisoners and to organize educational and recreational pursuits. Number four, the right to one visit, one letter, and one parcel per week. Number five, full restoration of remission lost through the protest. The hunger strike was led by Bobby Sands, who was serving a 14-year sentence for firearm possession. About a month into the hunger strike, in April 1981, a by-election was held in the United Kingdom because a member of Parliament had suddenly died. Bobby Sands was elected to Parliament, and this brought a lot of attention to the hunger strike. Sands, who was 27, died on May 5, 1981, after not eating for 66 days. Over a thousand people attended his funeral. On October 3, 1981, after the government agreed to let the IRA prisoners wear their own clothes, the hunger strike ended. They had also given in to three other demands. The only demand they didn't give in to was the right not to do prison work. During the hunger strike, ten men died. Six men participated, but stopped. Seven were still starving themselves when the strike was called off. The hunger strike had a major impact on politics in the United Kingdom. It helped make Sinn Féin a mainstream political party. On October 6, 1981, there was a military parade in Cairo, Egypt. The country's president, Anwar Sadat, was in attendance. Members of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad jumped out of a truck in front of where the president was sitting. Three grenades were thrown at the president, and then the men opened fire. During the attack, 62-year-old Anwar Sadat was killed. Another 10 people were killed, and 28 people were injured. The American president, Ronald Reagan, and three former presidents, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, and Jimmy Carter, were going to attend the funeral. On October 8th, the three former presidents flew together on a plane to Washington, D.C., it was the first and only time that three former presidents flew on the same plane. The current and three former presidents were transported separately to Cairo. About six months after the assassination, six people who took part in the assassination were executed. On October 9, 1981, the Rolling Stones played the first of two shows at the Los Angeles Coliseum. They had three opening acts, George Thurgood and the Destroyers, the J. Gels Band, and Prince, a relatively new artist. Prince played three songs before he was booed off stage. Concert goers also threw garbage at him. Prince Rogers Nelson was moderately successful at that point. He had released three albums and was days away from releasing his fourth. Months earlier, in February 1981, he performed on Saturday Night Live. But the Rolling Stone fans did not enjoy Prince and they threw trash at him. The other two opening acts were much better received. They both played encores. Prince went on to be one of the most successful musicians of his generation. He sold over 150 million records and won seven Grammys. He also won an Academy Award for Best Original Song Score for the autobiographical film Purple Rain. On April 21, 2016, 57-year-old Prince died of an accidental overdose. On October 15, 1981, the number one song was Arthur's theme, Best That You Can Do by Christopher Cross. The number one movie was the Burt Reynolds-like comedy, Paternity. In October 1981, 30-year-old Sonia Herrick Stone was living in Carmel-by-the-Sea, California. In 1981, the coastal city, commonly known as Carmel, had a population of about 4,700 people. Sonia was born in Montreal, Quebec and moved to California in the early 1970s. 
1976, she got married to a man named Michael Stone, and the marriage produced a daughter, Sasha. But after a few years of marriage, Sonia and her husband separated. In 1981, Sonia was working as a sales representative for Levi Strauss. Sasha was four years old. On the morning of October 15, 1981, Sonia dropped her daughter off at preschool. She then returned home before going to work. That day, Sonia's friend, Caroline McBride, who was a real estate agent, was working in Sonia's neighborhood. She saw Sonia's car in the driveway and decided to stop in. She knocked on the door and there was no answer. McBride thought it was odd because Sonia's car was in the driveway. McBride tried to open the door, but something heavy was blocking it. She managed to get the door open a bit and saw Sonia's bare legs. She ran from the house and got into her car. She was worried that whoever attacked her friend might be inside, so she sped away. When she saw someone washing their car, she stopped and had him call the police. On the floor, inside the front door, was the dead body of 30-year-old Sonia Herrick Stone. She was only wearing her jacket, bra, and shirt. They were bunched up around her neck. A pair of pantyhose was wrapped tightly around her neck. It was determined she had been raped and strangled to death. There were no signs of a break-in or forced entry. The police discovered the back door was unlocked. Close to her body was her purse. The police surmised that the killer came through the back door and surprised Sonia when she came home after dropping off her daughter. He then attacked her. When he killed her, he was kneeling over her and he was face to face with her as he strangled her. Sonia put up a fight before she died. The fingernail on her left ring finger was broken. So the police believe she scratched her killer as she is being attacked. The police interviewed Caroline McBride, who discovered the body. She said that shortly before the murder, Sonia was getting strange phone calls. The caller would hang up as soon as she picked up. Also, Sonia was getting the eerie feeling that someone was watching her. McBride said that one night she was at her house and they heard someone outside in the bushes. She said the footsteps were incredibly loud. She told the news program, W5, that it sounded like it was Bigfoot. The detectives asked McBride who she thought might have killed Sonia. She thought Sonia's estranged husband, Michael Stone, might have killed her. She thought Sonia believed that Michael was sexually abusing their daughter, Sasha. In May 1980, a doctor examined Sasha and talked to her. He determined that there had been no sexual abuse. But the police thought that even if Michael had not been abusing his daughter, he may have been angry that he was even accused of doing something so heinous. Michael was interviewed and the police thought he was being uncooperative. The investigators decided to see if they could place him near the crime scene around the time of the murder. They started interviewing people in Sonia's neighborhood. About 23 hours after the body was discovered, they went to the home across the road. They had been there the day before, but no one was home. They found the resident in the backyard working on his boat. Two things stuck out to the detectives immediately. When standing on the boat, he could see into Sonia's house. The second was that the man was muscular, and it was clear he was a bodybuilder. At the time, he was wearing a paper mask over his face. The detectives introduced themselves and asked if the man could remove his mask. When he did, the detectives were immediately drawn to his right cheek. There was a four-inch scratch under his right eye to the bottom of his jaw. The scratch continued down his neck, but it was fainter. This is notable because Sonia had a broken fingernail on her left hand. If she scratched her killer's face, it would have been on the right side. The man introduced himself. He was 25-year-old Michael Glazebrook. He and his wife had recently moved into the neighborhood. Glazebrook was asked if he saw anything unusual on the morning of the murder. 
He said he had been working on his boat until 10 a.m., then he went to his parents' home. He didn't return home until the early evening. He said he didn't see or hear anything unusual. The detectives then asked what happened to his face. He said on the night of the murder, he had been cutting plexiglass and it splintered. A shard cut his face. He said he had gone to the hospital the night of the murder and he had just been released that morning. The police thought that this was strange because it was a minor scratch. So they asked him why he stayed overnight in the hospital. He then changed his story and said he went to the hospital that morning. They noted that the scratch seemed to be made in a downward stroke. If a flying piece of plexiglass had cut him, it would have been an upward stroke. The detectives asked to see the garage and Glazebrook agreed. The detectives did not see any blood on the plexiglass or in the garage. The police were immediately suspicious of Glazebrook. It turned out that their other suspect, Michael Stone, had an alibi for the time of the murder. The police looked at their records and discovered Glazebrook had outstanding traffic warrants for failing to appear in court for traffic violations. So a couple days after interviewing him, they arrested him on the outstanding warrants. They wanted to get a photograph of the scratch on his cheek. In custody, the detectives told Glazebrook they wanted to talk to him about the murder of Sonia Herrick Stone. They asked him to take a polygraph, and he agreed. He failed the polygraph. He was confronted with the results. He was also asked what would he say if they found his fingerprints in Sonia's house. Glazebrook then said he had been in Sonia's house on the morning of the murder. He claimed that he had been having an affair with Sonia. But he said that he left around 10 a.m. and she was still alive. The police questioned Sonia's closest friends and none of them said that Sonia was having an affair with Glazebrook. The police knew that Sonia had scratched her attacker. Under her fingernails was some human tissue. At the time, the only thing they could do was test for blood type. It was the same blood type as Michael Glazebrook. The police interviewed friends and family of Glazebrook. One friend, who was a former lover, said that Glazebrook told her that he was at Sonia's house on the morning of the murder. In July 1982, nearly 10 months after the murder, Glazebrook was charged with murder. The district attorney thought that they had a good case. Sonia had scratched her killer, and Glazebrook had a scratch on his face. Also, the killer had the same blood type as Glazebrook. Glazebrook also had major problems keeping his story straight about many things. He initially said he cut himself on the day of the murder and spent the night in the hospital. Later, he said he went to the hospital the morning before he was questioned. He claimed he didn't know Sonia, then days later, he said that they were in a sexual relationship. He also said he had not been in Sonia's home, but they admitted he had been there on the morning of the murder. Before they went to trial, the prosecution's case was dealt a serious blow. The judge ruled that the interrogation could not be used as evidence because Glazebrook had been arrested on traffic warrants. But the pretext of the arrest was to question him about the murder case that was unrelated to the traffic warrants. Michael Glazebrook went to trial in November 1983. The prosecution said that Glazebrook was probably working on his boat when he saw Sonia return home after dropping off her daughter. His plea that she stopped at home to pick up something before work. Glazebrook went in the back door and attacked her. Then more problems with the case arose. The police did not have a photograph of the scratch on Glazebrook's face. The photo was supposed to be taken after he was arrested, but the camera malfunctioned. On the day of the murder, Glazebrook said that he went to his parents' house after 10 a.m. and stayed there until the early evening. Both of his parents testified that when he came to their home, he did not have any scratches on his face. The tissue under Sonia's fingernails was the same blood type as Glazebrook. However, 28% of the population have the same blood type. 
The interrogation that was not allowed to be used as evidence was important because Glazebrook admitted to being in Sonia's home on the morning of the murder. The district attorney thought they could get over this because Glazebrook's friend told the police that Glazebrook had admitted to her that he was in Sonia's home that morning. On the stand, the witness recanted what she said. She claimed she was angry at Glazebrook at the time. Also, the police were hassling her, so she told them what they wanted to hear. The trial lasted about two weeks, then the jury deliberated for two days. The jury could not come to a unanimous decision. Three had voted to convict, and the other three had voted to acquit. A mistrial was declared. Because the jury was leaning towards acquit, the district attorney decided not to retry Michael Glazebrook. If they did retry him with the same evidence, they risked the possibility of him being acquitted and they'd never be able to try him again. So the charges were dismissed. The case then went cold. Although Sonia's estranged husband, Michael Smith, was cleared as a suspect, suspicion hung over him for decades. Years later, he started dating a woman. Another woman he dated called his new girlfriend. The ex-girlfriend told his new girlfriend that he was abusive, he was a child molester, and he had killed his wife. One person who never forgot about the murder was Sonia's daughter, Sasha, who was four when her mother was killed. In 1995, when Sasha was 18, she went to the police station and talked to the lead detective on the case. She wanted the case reopened. But the detective said there was no new information or evidence. Until there was, the case would remain closed. Thirteen years later, in 2009, a new detective was assigned to the case and it was reopened. Of course, a lot had changed in those 28 years. But unfortunately, the sheriff's department didn't have the money or the workforce to do any forensic testing. Then in July 2020, the district attorney announced that they were opening a new cold case task force. It had been 39 years since 30-year-old Sonia Herrick Stone's murder. In 1981, the three biggest movies of the worldwide box office were Superman II, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and On Golden Pond. In 2020, the number one movie in the world was the Chinese historical war drama, The 800. It was the first time that China had the biggest box office hit. The COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns in North America contributed to this. The second biggest movie was the Japanese animated film Demon Slayer the movie Maguin Train. Once again, this is notable because it was the first time two non-American movies were at the top of the worldwide box office. The third biggest movie was Bad Boys for Life. 2020 was the first time in over a decade that Disney didn't have a movie in the top three. Disney didn't even have a movie in the top 10 in 2020. Their best performing movie was Onward, which was 16th of the box office. The three biggest hits on the Billboard charts in 1981 were Betty Davis Eyes by Kim Carnes, Endless Love by Diana Ross and Lionel Richie, and Lady by Kenny Rogers. In 2020, they were Blinding Lights by The Weeknd, Circles by Post Malone, and The Box by Roddy Rich. Popular TV shows that debuted in 1981 were Hill Street Blues, Dynasty, and The Smurfs. In 2020, major shows that premiered were Bridgerton, Celebrity IOU, and Ted Lasso. In 1981, popular books published were A Light in the Attic by Shel Silverstein, the first book to feature Hannibal Lecter, Red Dragon by Thomas Harris, and Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark by Alvin Schwartz. In 2020, some of the more popular books published were the Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett, A Promised Land by Barack Obama, and Suzanne Collins' prequel to the Hunger Games trilogy, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. In 1981, the patent for the first color ID was issued, the IBM personal computer was available for purchase, and dogs could eat kibbles and bits dog food. For snacks, score bars were sold for the first time, Act 2 popcorn was available, and Prego pasta sauce could be purchased for the first time. New products in 2020 were the fourth generation of Xbox, the Series X and Series S, 
AirPod Max were available, and several COVID-19 vaccines were developed. Because of lockdowns and the fact that people couldn't dine in at restaurants, people frequently ate for fast food restaurants that already had drive throughs and takeout service. To entice customers, popular fast food restaurants introduced some fantastical items. For example, KFC sold chicken sandwich with glazed donuts as buns, McDonald's introduced a spicy version of its McNuggets, and Dunkin' Donuts released a spicy ghost pepper donut. Not long after the task force was formed in July 2020, the evidence from Sonia's case was sent for DNA testing. They were able to create a DNA profile for the tissue under the fingernail. Then they thought it would be easy because they had taken a blood sample from the prime suspect, Michael Glazebrook, during the initial investigation. But that's when they ran into a problem. Glazebrook's blood samples had been stored in two vials. Both vials broke and the blood leaked out. So the blood samples were no longer good. The police got a warrant to get a sample of Glazebrook's DNA. At the time, he was still living in Carmel. He was a school bus driver and a Little League umpire. He was a father and grandfather. The cold case investigator pulled him over near his home as he was driving to work. The inside of his cheeks were swabbed inside the detective's car. After getting the sample, the detective casually asked Glazebrook who he thought committed the murder. He said that he had heard that the daughter thought her father was the killer. The investigator then asked Glazebrook if he knew Sonia. He said that he had never met her. The cold case investigator was surprised to hear this because, in 1981, he said he had been having an affair with Sonia. But nearly 40 years later, he claimed she was just the woman who lived across the street. Glazebrook's DNA was compared to the DNA for the crime scene. It was 265 quadrillion times more likely to have come from Glazebrook than anyone else. Quadrillion is 19 zeros. Then, once again, the investigators ran into a problem. When the blood from the vials leaked, it leaked onto the envelope that was storing Sonia's fingernail. So they were worried that the evidence had been contaminated. If the blood had gotten onto the fingernail in evidence storage, this would explain why Glazebrook's DNA was found on the fingernail. But it turned out that the blood was only on the outside of the envelope and the fingernail had been stored in a wax bag in the envelope. So there was no contamination. But they wanted to be sure that was Glazebrook's DNA, so they wanted to test the rape kit. Unfortunately, the rape kit was not stored in evidence. Luckily, a crime lab had taken swabs from Sonia's breast, and they had been preserved. The swabs were tested, and a DNA profile was made. Once again, it was Glazebrook's DNA. On August 15, 2021, 65-year-old Michael Glazebrook was arrested. To honor Sonia, the arresting officers all wore Levi's jeans because Sonia had worked for Levi Strauss when she was killed. In January 2023, for the second time, Michael Glazebrook went to trial for Sonia Herrick Stone's murder. The major evidence against him, which was not available in the early 1980s, was the DNA evidence. The defense argued that the evidence was contaminated. Glazebrook's parents had died so they couldn't testify. So the defense used their testimony from the first trial, where they said he did not have a scratch on his face on the day of the murder. The trial lasted eight days and the jury deliberated for six hours. Glazebrook was found guilty of first degree murder. In June 2023, 42 years after the murder, Glazebrook was sentenced to life without the chance of parole. At the time of this recording, 68 year old Michael Glazebrook is incarcerated at the California Medical Facility in Vacaville, California. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Like we said in the opening, if you have any cases to suggest for Into the Killing, Criminally Listed, or Paranormally Listed, please visit our website, criminallylisted.com. But that's all for this week. Thank you again for listening. 
please stay safe and take care of yourself.